Okay, so uh, let, let me introduce you. It's my pleasure to introduce Christina Sormani from uh, City University of New York and Lehman College. And she agreed to give a beautiful uh, series of lectures on intrinsic flat and Gromov Hausdorff convergence. So please, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, so uh, let me just uh, start with a review of what we'll cover in this series of four lectures. All right, so in lecture one, I'm going to review geometric notions of convergence. So I'll begin with smooth, smooth convergence, CK and C0 convergence, Lipschitz convergence as in the Gromov style, gromov hausdorff convergence, which is denoted with the GH, um, the intrinsic flat convergence that I developed with Stefan Wenger, which will be denoted SWIFT. So some, some places it's just an F convergence. And the good references for this is Gromov Structures Matrix and uh, my paper with Stefan from 2011. For lecture two, we're going to discuss open problems about scalar curvature. So this will include almost rigidity of the positive mass theorem, geometric stability of the scalar torus rigidity theorem, and scalar sphere rigidity theorem and others. There will be many open problems mentioned that are on various levels. Some might take a decade to solve and others are steps towards the big problem or, or test cases. These um, problems are from a survey, Conjectures on Convergence and Scalar Curvature, which is on the archive, 2103.10093. This is a set of conjectures that I wrote up with um, some uh, participants at IAS um, Emerging Topics Group, including Romov and others. And so we wrote up conjectures in this area, but what would be the correct statements for these conjectures? And then in lectures three and four, I'll introduce techniques to apply to prove convergence, including ambrosio kirheims theory of integral currents, which is needed to define this uh, swift convergence rigorously. The decomposition into regions, which is a technique I developed with Sajad Lexian. Properties of these notions of convergence that I did with a, a paper with Portuguese and an arzela scoli theorems paper. And then I'll conclude with volume above, distance below um, techniques developed with Ryan Allen and Raquel Perales. All of these papers and many others about convergence are on this site, which includes links to all papers that have results on intrinsic flat convergence. So the goal today is to build geometric intuition. We want to view Riemannian manifolds as metric spaces and introduce the notion of integral current spaces in a less, in a more geometric intuitive way. And in lecture three, we'll introduce it in complete detail using ambrosio kirheim theory. The notions of convergence we're going to talk about will be smooth convergence, which is only defined on Riemannian manifolds, gromov lipschitz convergence, which is defined for metric spaces, gromov hausdorff convergence, which is defined on metric spaces, the intrinsic flat convergence, which is defined on Riemannian manifolds and a larger class of spaces called integral current spaces. Notice again, there's two notations for this convergence. And volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence, which is a convergence that's a little bit stronger than the intrinsic flat convergence in that it also requires that the volumes of the manifolds converge to the volume of the limit space. We'll discuss how we measure volume in these spaces later. And then we'll talk about a new notion of convergence called VADB convergence, volume above, distance below convergence, which is in as a consequence of a paper I wrote with Brian Allen and Raquel Perales, in which we showed that this notion of convergence implies volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence. But this is a simpler notion and everyone can work with this to do test cases on the various conjectures. Recommended resources are Gromov Structures Matrix, which is the original book in French that I learned this from, but then there's Barago Barago Ivanov's textbook in English. Um, there's the paper in JDG 2011, which introduces the integral current spaces and the intrinsic flat convergence. And then there's this conjectures paper I mentioned, which surveys what's needed here, but doesn't have the full detail of either of these books. So recall Riemannian manifold is a smooth metric space. And we'll, now oh, what's going on? A smooth collection of charts, which allows us to define tangent vectors and tangent planes at each point and a metric tensor G, which is the inner product on tangent vectors, such that the distance with respect to G between two points is the infimum of length of curves where the length of the curves is defined using this metric tensor G. 
I'm emphasizing these points because later we'll have integral current spaces and they won't have all these properties. When M is compact, you can actually find a geodesic gamma PQ. So the length of gamma PQ is actually equal to the distance from P to Q. And to get to you used to the kinds of pictures I'll be drawing, this is, a, I generally draw three-dimensional pictures just as black shadows. So this would be a three-dimensional sphere with a bump on it. The geodesics curve along the bump or go around behind or a torus, you can go out the top and come in the bottom and so on. So just keep in mind that the pictures I'm drawing are shadows of three-dimensional manifolds. If you have a CK limits of sequences of Riemannian manifolds, what you have is a sequence of Riemannian manifolds. Here's first one, second, third, and the limit. The limit is also a Riemannian manifold. And the whole sequence is diffeomorphic to one another. The diffeomorphisms go from the limit space back to MJ. So you have a diffeomorphism going backwards for each one. And I tried to capture this with the rainbow here so you could see which regions are mapped to which regions under these diffeomorphisms. As you can see, the red and purple regions are stretched out here. And that's because the phi j star gj, when you pull it back, will be rather stretched. But as j increases, this, this phi j g star gj will converge to g infinity ck smoothly. The diffeomorphisms need to be ck plus one in order to have these converging uh, to be defined well to be ck smoothly, because remember that the metric tensor is measuring the lengths of vectors. One consequence of this is that the distance here between two points in the limit space is equal to the limit of the distances between points mapped under these diffeomorphisms. And the volumes of balls in the limit space is equal to the limit as j goes to infinity, the volumes of the balls around the points that converge to that limit. So these two properties are the key properties that we're actually going to keep looking at again. And this was also brought up in Professor Mandino's talk about how important it is to keep track of distances and volumes. In fact, C0 convergence, which requires C1 diffeomorphisms, implies Gromov-Lipschitz convergence. Now Gromov-Lipschitz convergence has a distance between two, the Lipschitz distance between two Riemannian manifolds is the log of the maximum of the dilation or Lipschitz constant of phi j and the dilation of phi j inverse. So since these two dilations will be converging to one when it gets to the same shape, then you take a log so that it converges to zero. So this is actually a distance function. This is Gromov's Lipschitz distance function. You can read about it in either of the references I gave, Gromov's original book or in Virago Virago Ivanov. And the dilation is this ratio here. This actually is well-defined for by Lipschitz sequences of metric spaces. So you don't need to have diffeomorphisms or metric tensors. Lipschitz limits of sequences of metric spaces Again, you only need by Lipschitz, and then these maps, the dilation of phi j and the dilation of psi j inverse goes to one. And again, we'll have distances converge and volumes converge. There are examples where there's no CK or Lipschitz limit. And this happens, for example, in this sort of sequence where you have a sphere with a bump, but the bump is becoming thinner and thinner. I will often call these wells or gravity wells because this comes from the idea of a three-dimensional space and it has a well forming, like a gravity well around a planet. Um, so this sort of is an intuitive way of thinking about things. And these sort of spheres can be constructed with positive scalar curvature in three dimensions. Now we know that these examples have no CK limit because if you look at the balls around points on the tip, the volumes of those balls are gonna go to zero. So you see these orange balls? their volumes is going to zero. So that fails this property and therefore it has no CK or Lipschitz limit. Here I also did tori, flat tori. The balls get to have volume going to zero. So these are, this one's what's called collapsing down here. And this one only part of the region is collapsing. This phenomenon where one part of the manifold collapses and the other part doesn't collapse is special to scalar curvature. You will learn that with sequences of manifolds with non-negative Ricci curvature, you can't have the volume of a small piece go to zero without taking the rest of the manifold to zero with it because of bishop Gromov volume comparison. So here we're going to be interested though with scalar curvature manifolds on my series of lectures. So it's going to be important to us to understand that some points are going to zero, disappearing, and other points will stay behind. And we need a notion of convergence to handle this. So first you have the Gromov-Hausdorff limits. 
So the original definition by Gromlov is you have compact metric spaces, X, J, D, J. They converge in the Gromlov house of sense to X infinity, D infinity. So here are the metric spaces limits of these two sequences we've been talking about. The tori are going to a circle and the spheres with the bump are converting to a sphere with a line segment attached. And the definition says there are epsilon j almost isometries going from the limit space to each of the xj's. They are almost distance preserving. That means the distances, the difference in the distances is small, less than epsilon j. And they're almost onto. That means that the xj itself is contained in a tubular neighborhood of radius epsilon j around the image of the original guy. So I just wanna give a picture of this using the rainbows again. So here's our original map. This is the map. It has to go from the sphere with the line segment to these spheres. And so the line segment part doesn't cover the whole thing. So this you can see is not onto. The line segment part is not reaching. The black part here is not covered by the map, but this black part is getting to have smaller and smaller distance to the colored part, which is in the image. So this tubular neighborhood epsilon j has epsilon j going to zero. And the distances are distorted somewhat right over here, but that's all right because the distances are distorted less and less. Note that the rainbow drawn psi j's, which are the almost epsilon almost distance preserving maps are not onto, nor are they continuous. You see that it's broken open. So that's definitely not a continuous map. For the tori converting to a circle, the easiest map to construct is actually exactly distance preserving. Just take a copy of the circle inside each of these tori. And all you have to do is check the tubular neighborhood work. So the epsilon j for this one would be this height from here to here. The epsilon j from this one will be this small and smaller and so on. So only the tubular neighborhood has to be checked. This is actually distance preserving that. All right. Gromov has a proposition that says that compact x, j, d, j, Gromov house will converge x infinity, d infinity, if and only if there are some epsilon j's and there are epsilon j nets, s, j, contained in x, j. So s, j, I've made green dots to indicate them. Which are can, and the x, j themselves are in the tubular neighborhood or radius epsilon j of these nets, s, j. So I actually make the s, j's discrete sets of points here. And I say tubular neighborhood radius epsilon j covers that. That means if you take balls around these points, the union of the balls covers the whole space. These have to be finite. These epsilon j, well, you can show that they are finite. And epsilon j almost distance preserving bijections psi j going from s infinity back to sj. So we just have to map the nets now instead of the whole manifold. And we have the distance almost preserved here. So the, the distances between these guys are close together. And that's enough to prove that this xj sequence converges in the Gromov positive sense to the limit space. You are gonna have to take tighter and tighter nets in order to achieve the proof. So you see you increase the number of dots and you increase it again as needed. Now this idea of having fewer dots and increasing the number of dots in order to figure things out is the main idea towards proving Gromov's compactness theorem. Gromov's compactness theorem says that if x, j, d, j are compact metric spaces and the diameter is bounded above uniformly, and for every r, there is r nets, s, j, r, with cardinality n, r that doesn't depend on j. So that means that the same number of points in each net, then a subsequence x, j, k, d, j, k, gromov hausdorff converges to x infinity, d infinity, where x infinity is compact. So we wanted to get a geometric intuition for why this is true. You can look at the dots and the increasing of the number of dots. So the proof involves fixing first R greater than zero and restricting GJ to SJR cross SJR gives an NR by NR matrix. So let's think about that. Since there's the same number of dots for the, for the R net for each one of these guys, what we are looking at is an NR by NR matrix where the matrix reveals distances between each pair of points. So the entries of this matrix are the distances between all combinations of the net points. And that's enough information to know whether that net is gonna be converging or not. Then you take a sequence R to zero and diagonalize the converting subsequence of matrices. So here, because this one was NR by NR, we could take a subsequence such that as J goes to infinity, this NR by NR matrix converges to some matrix, which will be symmetric, 
and we'll start to apply the triangle inequality too. But some of the entries might become zero. If you take a sequence R going to zero and diagonalize the sequences, you'll get a converting subsequence of matrices. And each one of these matrices corresponds to nets. So this gives a countable pseudo metric space with R nets of cardinality NR. So what I'm doing is, I don't know if you notice that the dots became more and more as we went along. So first you make a subsequence such as the first set of dots converges. Then you make a subsequence such as the second set of dots also converges. And then the third set of dots also converges. And you end up constructing this pseudo metric space, which might have zero distance between some of the dots where the first bunch of dots, the first N1 collection of dots is an R net, an R1 net, and the next N collection of dot is an R2 net and so on with R1, R2 going to zero. And you've gotten this really crowded collection of dots here with distances between them. Some of the distances are zero. X infinity is then the metric completion of this pseudo metric space. So you take all these dots that you've created over here and you take a metric completion, which means you take all Cauchy sequences and say and prescribe that they converge to points in the space. And this is the proof of Gromov's compactness theorem. Are there any questions at this point? No questions? I'm not hearing anything. All right, so I don't hear anybody saying any questions. All right, so I will continue. Can somebody say something just so I'm sure everyone hears me? Yes, we hear yes, you. Okay, great, you. perfect. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. I just, uh, all right, so this is the proof of Gromov's compactness theorem. And now, is it, if everyone's happy with it, then we will continue forward. So the key idea then is if you have a sequence of Riemannian manifolds, you look for what possibilities give you the guarantee that there is an R net with cardinality NR. And if you have seen some of the other talks, Ricci curvature greater than equal to H and diameter less than equal to D was enough to prove the existence of an R net using bishop gromos volume comparison theorem. So you count the number of balls. Each ball had a certain amount of volume because of that comparison theorem relative to the volume of the whole space. And then you... And then you take the ratios and you, you sum them up. So because of this, when you have a sequence of manifolds with Ricci curvature bounded below by H and diameter bounded above by D, then a subsequence MJK, Gromov Hausdorff converges to X infinity. And you actually have a limit space that is a compact metric space. Okay, there's another version of Gromov Hausdorff distance that I need to introduce, which is called the, um, the notion Gromov Hausdorff as intrinsic Hausdorff. So Gromov actually called it the intrinsic Hausdorff distance. So what this means is the Hausdorff distance, you might recall here, this is the Hausdorff distance. The Hausdorff distance between two, two sets is the infimum of radii of the image of one set contained in the tubular neighborhood of the other, and the other is in the tubular neighborhood of the first. So the Hausdorff distance between this blue and this red part is roughly this diagonal length here which guarantees that every point in the blue set is definitely within that distance from the red, and every distance, every point in the red set is within that same distance from the blue. So this is the Hausdorff distance, but the Hausdorff distance refers to subsets of a larger space Z. An intrinsic Hausdorff distance is supposed to compare two intrinsic Riemannian manifolds or metric spaces that are not lying in a common space. They lie in their own spaces and are not related in any way. And you want to measure the distance between them imitating the Hausdorff distance. So what you do is you say the infimum over the Hausdorff distance in Z of the images of these two sitting inside Z, where the infimum is taken over all compact metric spaces Z, so you can change your Zs, and over all distance preserving maps phi i from MIM to Z. So distance preserving, not almost distance preserving, exactly distance preserving. So distances between points at M1 is exactly equal to the distances after you map them by the phi one map. And the distances between points in M2 is exactly the same distance before and after you map by the phi two map. So this gromov hausdorff distance between compact metric spaces actually agrees nicely with the existence of an epsilon almost isometry, 
In fact, if the realm of Hausdorff distance is less than epsilon, you can find a two epsilon almost isometry that goes from M2 to M1. So let's look at this to see how we get that. I want to take a map that goes from M2 to M1 here. So what I'll first do is I'll take the phi2 map and look over here. And then I'm going to say, oh, there's actually a point here, M1, in M1, whose distance between the phi2 of M2 and this point here in the image of M1 is less than this R that achieves this femum, one of these Rs. So you get a process to find an M1, and then you have a second one, and you find an M2, and each one is off by R. And so that sums up to be towards 2R. You have to do a little bit more work because it's an aim femum, and you're not necessarily going to assume it's achieved and so on, but that's the rough idea. Okay, so the idea is to let psi P be the point Q in M1, such a distance from phi 2 of P to phi 1 of Q is minimal. Then Gromov also proved that if the gromov hausdorff distance of M1, M2 is equal to zero, there's actually an isometry that goes from psi from M2 to M1. But this is for compact metric spaces. It's very important to realize this is not true if we are not restricted to compact metric spaces. For example, a closed disk and an open disk, the gromov hausdorff distance between them is zero. It's only when you take the metric completions that it becomes unique and forces there to be an isometry that's global from one to the other. All right, so now we have gromov hausdorff as an intrinsic Hausdorff distance, and we said these two facts, and I just slide up what I just said so I can add some more below. So this is all just what was already on the board before. So now Gromov says there exists an epsilon homosometry psi j from m infinity to mj. If you have such a thing, then you can prove that the Gromov Hausdorff distance from mj to m infinity is less than epsilon. And I think that the easiest way to do this is you construct a metric space C, you can use the nets inside these guys. You're mapping nets from one to the other, and you can sort of set bridges between the two nets. So you have a collection of dots here, a collection of dots here, and you create lengths, little segments between them that are the right length so that you have distance preserving maps. You have to be careful. So this Z is made out of a lot of paths running between these two. It doesn't actually have to be any bigger than just a, a copy of M1 and M2 with appropriately defined distances, but geometrically it's kind of neat to picture it as having a lot of bridges running between M1 and M2. And Gromov proved if MJ Gromov Hausdorff converges to M infinity that is compact, then there exists a compact Z and there exists distance preserving maps phi J from MJ to Z, such that the Hausdorff distance in Z between phi j mj and phi infinity m infinity goes to zero. Now this is stronger than the other compactness theorem because it's saying that you can get the whole sequence into a single compact Z. And that's very useful and helpful for doing things like saying, oh, well now if you have sequences of points that are in the mj's, then you can look at their images in Z and a subsequence converges using Bolzano Weierstrass theorem and you'll get a point in the m infinity and so on. So things of this sort, are very easily done because Gromov has proven that there is this compact Z. Now, this theorem is actually in his polynomial growth paper, groups of polynomial growth paper. It's not really in that structures metrics book. Note also that since they all have distance preserving maps into this compact Z, then you can use the fact that Z is compact to find a uniform upper bound, NR, on the number of points in an R net of MJ. Because Z, you can say that's, that Z can be covered by, uh, by, given any R, Z is covered by some R net of size NR, and then you use that to show that the MJs also have the same NR. So this is important to keep in mind. We're going to look at this again. Any questions? No question, though. No, okay. So now let's look at these sequences of manifolds. You could have a sequence of three-dimensional spheres and the bump is getting tighter and tighter. And so the limit actually happens in the Lipschitz and the gromov hausdorff sense to a manifold with a conical singularity at the tip. 
you could have sequences of spheres with um, holes cut out of them and tinier and tinier holes. And then the Gromov Hausdorff limit is defined as it's a smooth manifold with a single point singularity. And that point has infinite topological type at the tip. Um, you can see my paper with Gofeng Wei, where we talk about controlling the topology of Gromov Hausdorff limits. And Gofeng Wei has many new results in this direction. So definitely interesting to speak with her about these um, properties of the limit spaces and how uh, what the topologies can be. If you have a sequence like this, where there's one bump on the sphere and then two bumps on the sphere and then three bumps on the sphere, now you can see that there isn't a uniform bound on the number of balls of radius R. And if there exists a Gromov of Hausdorff limit, then NR has to be uniform. So this means that there's no Gromov of Hausdorff limit for the sequence. Just picture this. If I keep my radius R to be like half the depth of these wells, this needs two, more than two, this needs more than three and so on. So there's not a uniform number of balls of radius R covering it. Ilmanen proved that there exist spheres in M3 with scalar grade in the zero and increasingly many wells. So actually these could be shadows of Ilmanen's examples. These wells here, each one of them is like having another planet in a, in a universe with one planet, then two planets and three planets. Very dense, very tiny planets, increasingly dense, increasingly tiny planets. And you end up with increasingly many wells. And so positive scalar curvature in three dimensions does not always have a gromov hausdorff limit. The gromov hausdorff works well for Ricci grading to H, but it doesn't work well for scalar curvature at all. So we need a new notion of convergence. In my um, second lecture, I'll describe more how these examples are exactly constructed and why they have positive scalar curvature. All right, so this is the one third mark of the talk and um, I'm going to start with the new notion of convergence now. So the new notion of convergence which is intrinsic flat convergence is inspired by gromov hausdorff being an intrinsic Hausdorff distance. And when it was an intrinsic Hausdorff distance, it was this distance taken in femum over all compact metric spaces complete, uh, metric spaces I and distance preserving maps and of the Hausdorff distance. So I just wanted to draw a picture so you get a sense here. The Hausdorff distance can be quite large if there's like a well. So think of this as like a part of a sphere. And this is the part of the sphere with a well, one of the spaces that's a part of Ilman in space. And you see that the depth of the well is contributing to the Hausdorff distance. To the limit. So these, these spheres are not in any way converting to, uh, these spheres with wells are not in any way converting to an ordinary sphere. Although physically one might like to say that that sequence that I have drawn there should, the sequence here should converge to a sphere in some new notion of convergence. Ilman and suggested that they ought to converge to a sphere. So we want to have a notion of convergence where these deep wells do not contribute a large amount of distance between the two spaces. So we're going to, again, do the same idea as the gromov hausdorff distance, but we're going to instead take the infimum of the flat distance of images. So this is the image of M1. I'm using geometric measure theory notation here. This is the image of the second one. So the same pictures as before. And the infimum is taken over all complete metric spaces. I'm not going to require the compact right now. The reason I'm not requiring them to be compact is that example of the sequence that I said with the more and more wells, they don't fit into a compact metric space. That sequence could never fit in a compact metric space because the number of balls is increasing. So I'm going to take the infimum over all complete metric spaces and over all distance preserving maps. That's the same as Gromov. And instead of using the Hausdorff distance, we use the Federer Fleming flat distance between these two submanifolds. So I want to give you an idea of what the Federer Fleming flat distance is. First of all, this, this is a way of saying image of M1, but not only is this an image of M1, but it's keeping track of its orientation. So I've put arrows on this to indicate that we are keeping track of the orientation of M1. And M2 also has to have arrows on it to keep track of its orientation. And then the Federer Fleming flat distance is the infimum of this length of an A that's used to close it up. So I'm closing it up with a little bit of an A over here and a little bit of A over here, drawn in green. And then the area of the B that can be used to fill it in. 
So I say length. By length, I sort of mean the same dimensional volume area as the original pair of manifolds. So if these are M dimensional, this would be M, M volume. And the B is one dimension higher. And it's a filling in. Of a, it's not quite a submanifold. I will get into the details a bit. But the idea is that we're now taking the infimum of the length of the little green parts and the area of the yellow parts such that we close up the area, the A plus the two images with the correct orientation subtracted, just so that it works with Stokes theorem, plus the boundary of B. So now this is not very large. If the, if the well has a very small volume inside it. So if the volume inside the well, which is a volume of a dimension higher than the manifold, is very small, then this could be quite small. So I made a fat well here, so it doesn't look that small, but as the well gets narrower and narrower, this will become, this B could become very small. And this is rigorously defined using Ambrosio Kirheim's notion of um, metric spaces and bi Lipschitz charts and integral current structures and set T's. I'm going to go over this in complete detail in lecture three. For now, you can sort of just imagine B is a submanifold of one dimension higher, and A is the submanifold of the same dimension such that if you integrate over B, you end up getting that the boundary of B is equal to the combination of A and the difference in the two images the manifolds are interested in. So in this picture here, the orientation of M1 and the orientation of M2, you see they're going in the same direction. So when you subtract them, you end up with the, the, the boundary of B going around this way. If M2 was oriented the other way, you couldn't use this picture, picture for B. It would have to be twisted in some way so that it can reach. And your A would have to go from here to here, there to there. So actually the orientation of a manifold makes a huge difference when you're measuring the swift distance between two manifolds. So this is called intrinsic flat distance because we're using the Federer flowing flat distance. And otherwise it's pretty much identical to Gromov's definition for intrinsic Hausdorff distance except that we're making this complete, which does make a, quite a difference going on here. It's only complete metric spaces, not compact ones. All right, let me do a higher dimensional picture. Now I have M1 and M2 looking two dimensional and it's the infimum over all complete metric spaces Z. So here's a picture of a sample Z and distance preserving maps phi one and phi two going into Z. Notice that topologies don't have to match. You can have all sorts of different parts, Z, can be made out of pieces of M1 and M2 and some other parts that are different dimensional. And the flat distance between these two guys sitting in the Z, which is this complicated picture here, would be finding a way to fill in between these two. So I'm gonna say, maybe I'll take my B to look like these two columns. That might be my B. And then I need to figure out what A is, right? So I have my M1 here and my M2 down here, that's taking up some of the boundary of B. And then we still have some more boundary to B that we need to incorporate into A. So I put that in green here. So we have this part here, which is from this edge. You see these edges here. So that, that would be part of A, this would be part of A. This part of um, M2 that isn't touched by the yellow, parts of M1 that aren't touched by the yellow, this sort of thing would give us an estimate. So the estimate, for um, the intrinsic flat distance between this M1 and M2 is roughly the volume, or it's less than or equal, because it's just a candidate. It's less than or equal to the volume of this yellow region plus the area of the green stuff, right? And the main idea is that you're choosing B to be a submanifold of one dimension higher so that when you apply Stokes theorem, you figure out what A is compared to these two guys. All right, so that's the definition of the intrinsic flat distance. In general, we're actually gonna have A's and B's be weighted integral currents inside a metric space Z. So they're gonna be allowed to have overlapping and you're keeping track of weights that are integer weights. And we will also generalize the definition of those spaces we're gonna measure the distances between. All right, so now with this definition, we say that MJ Swift converges to M Swift if the swift distance between MJ and M swift goes to zero. So again, we have these, these guys developing a conical singularity that's 
perfectly fine. It also converges in swift sense. These same guys with a single bump actually converge to a sphere with no bump at all because the single bump's volume can be filled in with a very tiny amount of B there. And the guys with increasingly many bumps, as long as the total filling volumes of the bumps is going to zero, you get also a sphere of the limit. And observe how regions of small volume are disappearing. So these regions with small volume tend to disappear under intrinsic flat convergence. They actually don't have to have small volume. All they need is for the filling volume that goes between them and the limit to be going to zero. So if they're very wrinkly and actually have not small volume, but the filling is, is small, that's enough to make the region disappear. We're going to talk more about filling volumes in um, lecture three and how that can be used to test whether something disappears or not. Because the regions of small volumes disappear, the limits might not be connected metric spaces. So picture this as a sphere that's starting to pinch in here. And then it gets narrower and narrower. And this, this pinching region here is such small volume, it just disappears. And the limit space is two spheres that are separate, but it's a single metric space. So we need to explain better what these limit spaces are. They're called integral current spaces. They are a metric space X and B and a T. They have countably many bi Lipschitz charts. So the charts are not smooth, but they're bi Lipschitz charts. They cover almost the whole metric space. And a notion of integration is defined over those charts, which is captured in this T, which is called an integral current structure. So this T is really just capturing, what does it mean to integrate a differential form except that we can't use differential forms because it's a metric space. So we have to use ambrosio kirchheim theory to make this rigorous. So we're going to have to do this rigorously in lecture three, but for now I can actually give you some pictures so you get a good sense of what T is about. So here's an example of how bad the integral current spaces can be. This can actually be done with a sequence of three dimensional manifolds with positive scalar curvature. You can connect all of these spheres here, three-dimensional spheres with tunnels, which physically you might call them wormholes running from two different universes. So each one of these is a different universe. You can have increasingly many of them. And the integral current space that's a limit actually doesn't even connect it at all because all those tunnels are getting very, very small. So this, this is a countable collection of spheres. The total volume of all these spheres is finite. An integral current space is M rectifiable, which means it has countably many by Lipschitz charts. So here you could say each one of these spheres has two charts, upper hemisphere, lower hemisphere, countably many. And each one is the same dimension as the original sequence. So we only talk about things of the same dimension. Otherwise we wouldn't even be able to define what it means for the A plus boundary B to be M1 minus M2. You can't do that if M1 and M2 have different dimensions. You need to be able to apply Stokes' theorem to describe what we mean by the boundary of B having pieces that look like M1, and pieces that look like M2, and pieces that look like A. An integral current space also has a well-defined M minus one dimensional rectifiable boundary. So this guy actually has no boundary because he's made out of spheres, but in general, he can have M minus one rectifiable boundary. The charts are oriented, not just orientable, they're actually oriented. They have an orientation assigned to them. And the sequence of compact Riemannian manifolds are also oriented. They have integer valued weights theta. So here, this picture, they all have weight one, but it's possible that two parts of a manifold come together and the limit, if they're oriented both in the same way, would have integer value weight equal to two for a region or for the whole thing. And you use these charts to define what's called the integral current structure T. So just think of T as recording that there's a bunch of charts and that the charts have weights and that the charts and weights together give you a notion of integrating so that you can define your A plus boundary B equals the difference between two integral current spaces inside Z. There's also a measure. It's denoted like this with two vertical bars around the T. And what it is, is it's, it's a multiple of Hausdorff measure the theta part comes from the weights and the lambda is something called an area factor. 
So I'm mostly mentioning this now. In lecture three, we will really talk about this a lot because people should be aware that the measures that are naturally on these limit spaces are not just the Hausdorff measure. They really have this extra aspect to them. Now, in the particular case where the sequence of manifolds happens to have a Ricci lower bound, theta will turn out to be one and lambda will turn out to be one and you will get the Hausdorff measure. Okay, but there's something very important to note that it's not always just the Hausdorff measure. These integer weights are influencing it. Yes. Um, Andrea. Yeah, Christina, can you ask a question about uh, this last part? Um, regarding uh, this measure that uh, you attach to the to the intercurrent planes. Uh, so if you have intrinsic flat convergence, do you also have a convergence of the measure, say, mass measure of the TJ to the mass measure of T, or not? No, you don't. Um, you have limits. Okay, just right. Uh, and if it's... Um, and then when we introduce when you have, um, volume preserving, then we're going to add that we have that. Okay, so if, even if you are not collapsing, a priori you don't have convergence. Say that again. So um, <laughs> you have the limit, and say in the in the case of yeah. uh, collapsing, uh, I see it, and you also have the limit on you. You also expect only the limit when you have uh, non-collapsing. So even if even if uh, you have a uniform lower bound on the volumes, right. So the, the non-collapsing for us, there's always this problem that some regions are collapsing and some are not. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. Because yeah, I am but we can't make of, that uh, old where, statement of non-collapsing or not. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll yeah. have we could have some regions where the mass, the volumes of balls converge nicely, and other regions where the volumes disappear. And and that's yeah, what yeah, we want. It. It's designed to have that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Got it. But you'll see, you'll see more. I'm gonna keep mentioning this issue as we define a little bit stronger convergence than this one. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks. All right, so we're going to get to more about this also in lecture three, but I'll talk a little bit more about this also in today's lesson. All right, so we have the intrinsic flat distance. This is almost the same picture as we had before, but this time I'm changing it to be that the M lines are not Riemannian manifolds, but they're integral current spaces. So they're, they're metric spaces and they have this current structure, which is a weighted collection of charts. And so when we say the, dis the swift distance between two guys like this, instead of using that, you see this notation, phi one number T one, that says push forward the charts. So I'm gonna take my M one, which might have weights, twos and ones on it. And I'm gonna move phi one, I'm gonna look at the image of the chart. So I'm keeping track of the weight. So we're pushing forward, we're keeping track of the two. We're pushing forward the T two, we're keeping track of his twos and ones. So this is the, the reason we had that notation before with the, 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 this uh, symbol here. It's not just image of the, of the manifold or the metric space or the integral current space. It's actually keeping track of all the weights and the orientations when you push it forward. And then we take the infimum of these, what's called a mass and a mass of A plus the mass of B. And now the A's and the B's also could be weighted here. So you'll need to weight them just right so that when you take the A plus boundary B, you end up with the correct weights on the T1 minus T2. So you have to add weights to the A's and B's as well. And this gives you an idea that the A's and B's are actually also integral currents, but they're not spaces. They're just integral currents sitting inside Z. So they are like submanifolds, but they're not smooth. They have countable collections of charts with weights on them. Right, so this is basically the geometric intuition for the intrinsic flat distance between two integral current spaces. So at this point, we're at the halfway point. Um, I was thinking maybe we take a, a five minute break. And people can ask yes, questions. Yes, yes, that's the break. problem. Let's take a five minute break. Yeah. Okay, very good. I'm right here, though, so anyone wants to talk can talk to me. Have any question you, that you want to ask uh, right now? Not in the room. So if you wrote a question in the chat, just uh, hit your, your unmute and say it out loud.
All right, so we're returning to the lecture now. I'll just go quickly over this while people return. So remember that the Swift distance is based on the Gromov Hausdorff distance. It's an infimum, but it's an infimum over flat distances. And what we do is we push forward the chart structure here. That's what this symbol means. And we push forward the chart structure here. That's what this symbol means. And then we take the difference between these two chart structures and view it as a boundary of some higher dimensional 
integral current inside Z, and there will may need to an, a piece A, which is the same dimension so that you fill in all the gaps that are happening here. So this is um, the definition. And now I want to talk a little more about some examples. All right, so we have this example where it develops a conical singularity. We have the ones where things disappear. And we had this example where we saw that it could break into two parts. And if it's broken into two parts, Let's talk about what would be the integral current space. Um, the integral current space here would be a standard sphere and another standard sphere. And then we also need to, so distances between points on this sphere are the usual spherical distances. And distances between points here is the usual spherical distances. But a distance between a point here and a point here has to be defined so that it's a metric space. And that should be the limit of the distances between points here. So you think you see that they go into there and then across and then over. So the distance between a point in the top sphere and a point in the bottom sphere would be taking the distance from the bottom point to the North Pole across a line segment here and then from the South Pole to there. So that would be the definition of the distance between these two points for this specific sequence. The length of this segment would have to do with how much of a distance there is between the the smallest, the lowest point in the top half and the highest point in the bottom half that, that persist as opposed to disappear. So what about collapsing tori? So you have a sequence of tori, the gromov hausdorff limit was a circle. And what about spheres that shrink to a point? So the spheres are getting small and small radio. What, what should the intrinsic flat limit be? So, if the volume of the whole manifold goes to zero, then the sequence should somehow disappear altogether. And it should have a well-defined definition for saying that the sequence disappears. So we actually say that the sequence converges to the zero integral current space. Zero M is the zero integral current space. It is in the same dimension as M itself. So let's just discuss the zero M space. The zero M space is a space that has no set, it has no, the, the X of it is the empty sets, the distance between all points is zero, and the current is this collection of charts is all weighted by zero. So when we push forward our charts, we just get zero over here, and we use the exact same definition as before, but we're gonna replace all the phi two number M2s with zeros. So that just means that the A plus boundary B has to be the push forward of this guy with nothing else. So if the volume of MJ goes to zero, we get the MJ Swift to zero. We can see that by taking MJ to be our Z, MJ and the zero both have distance preserving maps into MJ. Let's take the identity map. So we get our phi J, MJ to itself. And then phi J is just the identity. And our A can be phi J number of MJ itself, make this guy actually our A, and then make B equal to zero. And so we get A is him. And then this guy, phi J M J, his mass is, his mass is the volume of the MJs. So it goes to zero. There is a question. Uh, there was a question in the chat. Uh, in which sense is this space M dimensional? Uh, by definition. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Just so that one is allowed to subtract it here. You don't want to talk about a difference between currents um, if they're not in the same space. To, they're not in the same world. It has to act on differential forms of dimension M. Right? In lecture three, this notation will be explained and this definition will be made rigorous using ambrosia kirheim theory because I really do have to explain what we mean by acting on a current, uh, being a current and how it acts on differential forms. Let me look at the chat again. Okay. All right, so when we use ambrosia kirheim we'll make it clear what we mean by saying subtraction of two currents and when can you add them and subtract them? What does it mean for them to act on a differential form? What is a differential form? When you're on a metric space, there aren't any differential forms and you need ambrosia kirheim to explain everything. 
All right, so now we have some compactness theorems. The first compactness theorem for swift convergence is from our original paper that I gave the citation for before. And it says that if MJ Gromov house swift converges to let's call it MGH, and the volume of MJs are less than equal to V naught, and the volume of the boundaries of MJs are less than equal to A naught, then there's a subsequence that swift converges to a swift limit. Now I'm using the blue for the MGH stuff, and I'm using the, this teal color here for the swift limits, because it's going to become important that they're different. The swift limit is a subset of the GH limit, or it's possibly equal to zero. So the proof uses Gromov to say, okay, remember that if there's a Gromov house of convergent sequence, you can put them all into the same compact Z. So we have images of the MJs all sitting in the same compact metric space Z. Once they're all sitting in the same compact metric space Z and their volume is bounded above and their area is bounded above, you can use ambrosio kierheims compactness theorem, which is an extension of federer Fleming's compactness theorem to say that a subsequence converges in the flat sense or the weak sense, the flat sense, called as currents to a limit. And then what we do is we rebuild this and say, ah, okay, so this has a swift limit. There is a limit. Then you have to do more work to show that the limit sitting inside Z is actually sitting inside the Hausdorff limit inside Z of these guys. And so then you can show that the swift limit is inside the Gromov Hausdorff limit, or possibly the swift limit is zero because this compactness theorem, ambrosio kierheim compactness includes the possibility that the limit space is zero. So here's a picture where you see that the Swift limit is just the sphere and the gromov hausdorff limit is a sphere with a segment. In another paper, not the same paper as this one, Stefan Wenger and I proved that if the volume is bounded below and the Ricci is non-negative, this is non-collapsing sequence of Ricci curvature, then the Swift and the gromov hausdorff limits agree. This is actually very difficult to prove. It involves using work of Perelman, work of Colding, old work of Perelman from like the 1990s. Um, work of Colding, um, Gromov's filling Riemannian manifolds paper. There's a lot of work to get the Swift limits agree with the gromov hausdorff limit in the setting of non-collapsing. Notice that in this setting of non-collapsing, it was already known that the gromov hausdorff limit is is rectifiable with by Lipschitz charts of dimension M. Actually better than that, but that's very important towards proving that this Swift limit agrees with the gromov hausdorff limit. So it's not a new proof of that fact. In other settings, if you manage to show that the Swift limit and the gromov hausdorff limit agree, you gain the fact that the gromov hausdorff limit has charts. Also in this setting, the Swift limit has weight one everywhere the lambda is one, so that theta and the lambda is one, and the measure of the limit, the Swift limit, the measure is the same as the Hausdorff measure. But you have the examples by Ilmanen that were three-dimensional scalar gradient with zero with increasingly many wells that had no gram of Hausdorff limit. And, uh, wait, let me not use that just yet. In fact, these exact examples we examined in our first paper together and show that that exact sequence does in fact converge in the swift sense to a standard sphere. So Ilmanen's original challenge to find a weak notion of convergence where his sequence converges to a round sphere was achieved with this notion. It's also achieved with some measured notions of convergence. Then Wenger proved this compactness theorem, which is really powerful. So it says that if the diameter of the MJs is less than or equal to D and the volume of the MJs is less than or equal to V and they have no boundary, I'm not talking about boundaries here in this case, then there exists a subsequence which, which converges to a swift limit, which might be the zero. So all you need is diameter and volume bounded above. If it has boundary, you need area of the boundary bounded above and that's it. You do not need any curvature condition at all to have a swift limit. So this is a really important theorem and sort of sets the in motion why this is a useful notion of convergence that you could use for scalar curvature because it didn't use any curvature bounds. It didn't use the sectional and Ricci curvature bounds that the Gromov house for convergence is always using. All right. Any questions on this? Maybe just 
Yeah. One question about uh, uh, your theorem with uh, Stefan. Um, can you uh, relax to reach the boundary below by a say, negative constant? Yeah, Matveyev and Portuguese have proven that. Okay, right, thanks. Yeah, it's actually quite a bit more difficult. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's again a volume lower bound that's positive and the Ricci greater than some negative n minus one h. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, okay, so now let's talk about another compactness. This one's a conjecture, all right? So this is a conjecture from the IS meeting. I said I was going to mention various conjectures from this meeting we had, um, and. The question says, suppose we have MJ3s that have volume less than or equal to V and diameter less than or equal to D. We already know some facts. We know by Wenger's compactness theorem that a subsequence converges in the Swift sense to M infinity. We're assuming there's no boundary here, okay? Possibly the zero space. And we know by our joint paper that the limit of the volumes is bigger than or equal to the mass of the limit space. The mass of the limit space was that thing that had the lambda theta Hausdorff measure. And we also know from our first paper that M infinity if it's not zero, will be at least m rectifiable. It's going to have countably many charts. It's going to have weights that are integer valued. It's going to have orientations. The conjecture says that if, in addition, we add that scalar is greater than equal to zero, and that the min aj is greater than equal to a. So what is min aj? It's something we, we're adding here. It's the minimum area of a closed minimal surface sitting inside mj3. So that's sort of a non-collapsing condition of sorts. It's replacing the volume lower bound, which seems to have no power at all. Um, there's all sorts of weird examples. But if we assume this min a greater than equal to a, where we assuming that there is a minimal surface, that the smallest size of a closed minimal surface, so it's a two dimensional thing inside a three dimensional space, is bounded below by a positive number, then we assume that m infinity is actually not zero and it has generalized scalar greater than equal to zero. Furthermore, we believe that MJVF converges to M infinity, which means it's volume preserving intrinsic fat convergence. That means that the Swift convergence and the limit of the volumes is the mass of the limit. This is actually quite strong and we're gonna talk about this more. Let me answer the question. Yes. Thomas? Yeah, so the mean AJ, so should, could we uh, relax that to stable minimal surfaces? No, there's a count example. Okay. Um, so let me tell you the count example because it's actually not that hard. Um, take, a, take a sequence of ellipsoids that are collapsing in the Grum of Hausdorff sense to a line segment. Mm -hmm. Their min A is, an, uh, is okay. sort of achieved by an unstable surface, and that's important to keep it from going mm -hmm. to zero. Because okay. its, its swift limit will be zero. And these unstable minimal surfaces are actually very important. They're these widths of Marquez and Nevis. Mm. And they were part of the IAS emerging topics group too. So the, the min A may be unstable or stable. Okay. And in different settings, the unstable will be more important. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, you're welcome. So the swift convergence here, um, we believe that we will have even better once we have these two conditions that not only will the limit not be the zero space, but we'll have volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence, which means that the volume is actually going to converge to the mass of the limit space. This mass, remember, is that Hausdorff measure times the weights times this lambda, which is an area factor. All right, we're gonna talk more about this volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence. There's lots of properties for it. And we can discuss that throughout this series of talks. In lecture two, we're gonna discuss this conjecture in depth related to open palms at various levels and present examples and partial solutions. So there's a number of strange examples which show why we want them in AJs. And they all have positive scalar. And um, we'll also see how this min AJ gives you some power over sequences of manifolds with scalar curvature bounds. And in lectures three and four, we're gonna rigorously define integral current spaces and their masses, SWIFT and VF convergence. So this is this VF convergence and techniques for proving these open palms. So the second lecture is gonna focus on the scalar curvature side of these things. And the um, third and fourth lecture will be more getting into the, um, the rigorous detail of Ambrosia-Kirheim theory. 
All right, so let's look at this um, volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence. And it's going to, if you want to prove it, you need to show that there's swift convergence and that the limit of the volumes converge. Once you do this much, you actually have a lot of nice extra properties for the space. But I'd like to introduce a new notion called VADB convergence. And in lecture four, oh, sorry, in lecture four, we're going to learn that the VF convergence implies measured convergence and other strong consequences of this notion that can be proven using ambrosio kirheim theory. When I say measured convergence, I mean the mass measure of the MJs converges to this mass measure of the M infinities, the double bars on them. Okay. Um, but the following theorem is going to let us prove the volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence for sequences of compact oriented Riemannian manifolds. And this is a, a, an important new theorem that's going to allow us to obtain this volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence in a variety of special cases. And it's been already applied to prove some of the theorems uh, conjectures that are going to be discussed about scalar curvature in the second lecture. So this is a theorem mostly by Allen and Perales. I sort of gave them some ideas on and off throughout the project, but I really, this is Brian Allen and Raquel Perales' theorem. Um, so MJ VADB to M infinity implies that MJ VF to M infinity and the VADB convergence is volume above distance below convergence, where you assume that the volumes of the MJs converge to the volume of M infinity, that there is a uniform upper bound on diameter and that there are C1 maps, C1 diffeomorphisms, phi j from M infinity to MJ. So this is diffeomorphism. Such that the distances and the J sequence are bigger than the distances in the, in the limit. So we're having volume coming from above and the distance is bounded from below. So that's why it's called volume above distance below convergence. So their theorem says that under these hypotheses, one's actually able to get that MJ converges in the volume preserving intrinsic flat sense to M infinity. What's nice about this notion though, is that it's very easy for people to now test various theorems that have been proposed, various conjectures that have been proposed for volume preserving intrinsic flat convergence. You can test, oh, if you do have the VADB convergence, do you get the results you, you're hoping to have for the volume preserving in terms of flat convergence? So this now makes a very easy test case and a new, a new kind of convergence that sort of generalizes the kinds of convergence we had at the beginning of the talk. So the open question is, if scalar is greater than or equal to zero and MJ VADB is to M infinity, then which properties of non-negative scalar curvature hold on M infinity? So remember that in the compactness theorem conjecture from IAS, it was scalar curvature greater than J and we had MJ's DF converged to M infinity conjectured. And then it was conjectured that there should be some properties of non-negative scalar curvature on the limit space. For which properties should they be? Remember with gromov hausdorff convergence, you keep the top and of triangle comparison from, from sectional curvature greater than to zero to the limit space. You have the triangle comparisons. And if you have Ricci curvature and you use gromov hausdorff convergence, then the limit space has nice properties on the measures that were discussed in Andrea Mendino's talk. And now we're saying if scale is greater than equal to J, what properties are on the limit spaces? One nice way to test this is by checking this volume above distance below convergence. Many of the properties of scalar curvature have been tested with Lipschitz convergence. And this is weaker than the Lipschitz convergence in many, in most respects, except for this little part here. So it's a good test to whether you really believe it should be holding beyond such a strong situation where Lipschitz convergence happened. All right. So let me just go over all the notions that we have and the consequences of each. If you have CK convergence, then you have C0 convergence. And if you have C0 convergence then you have Lipschitz convergence, and if you have Lipschitz convergence, you have gromov hausdorff This is the first one that lets you have different topologies and different dimensions on limits and everything. All of these, they're basically the same topologies and the same, same dimensions. Gromov's compactness theorem works for diameters and Ricci, and they give you a gromov hausdorff converting subsequence. The 
a practice theorem that we first proved together said that once you have the Gromov house converging subsequence and a volume bounded above, then you have a swift converging sequence that ends up inside the Gromov house reform. And now this is the one where you have the Ritchie lower bound added back and volume lower bound. Then the Swift limit agrees with the Gromov Hausdorff. Madveev, Portuguese, extended it to negative H's here. And Wenger's compactness theorem is far more general. It only assumes a diameter and a volume bound. If there is a boundary, it only needs the area of the boundary to be controlled. Then a subsequence of the MJK Swift converges. And then this, this last collection, if you have MJs converging in elliptic sense to M, then you know, just add C1 to pheomorphisms, you get MJVADB to M, and then you get MJVF to M. This is the key theorem from this paper. And once you have MVF, you definitely have M Swift because MVF just means M Swift plus also volumes controlled. So this is another sequence. So this is a cheat sheet for everybody. And then we have the conjecture that diameter volume above, scalar below, and this min A below will give us the VF convergence to a Swift limit. And this is the key extension we're hoping to have for the old Ritchie curvature story here, where there's so many properties on MGH coming from this, also using a measured limit as Andrea Mendino is discussing. You get nice properties on this MGH. And here, we're hoping to have very interesting properties on M Swift coming from the scalar curvature gradient to zero. Yes. Uh, so the... So you're not putting it on the slide, but the conjecture, the last conjecture is in 3D, right? Yes, it is 3D. Thank you for, <laughs> yes. Everything else on the slide was not 3D. Mm -hmm. So that was a little misleading, yes. <laughs> um, how about we just say everything in this entire, um, it's also without boundary. Anyone who's interested in, in the corresponding theorems with boundary should ask Raquel Perales. She has lots of theorems um, extending all sorts of these projects, all sorts of these um, projects to having uh, boundary settings. But Vanger's compactness did have a boundary in the original one. Thank all you. Right. You're welcome. Another all right. question. Can I ask? Uh, I don't think. Yeah. Just quickly. Um, say for Ricci, uh, we know that, say, uh, um, Assuming no negative Ricci simplifies life, uh, but basically then uh, one can prove all the results also with a uh, negative lower bound uh, once one is right. correctly phrased. Um, what about scalar? Because I don't have so much uh, intuition about scalar. So do you expect uh, your conjecture to be false uh, if you have scalar bigger than, say, minus one? Or uh... We're not sure the min A is natural for scalar that's negative. Okay. Um, so one thing that there's a lot of that's been proven about uh, minimal surfaces, stable ones in manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature are very restricted from Shane Yao's theorems. Yeah. And um, if scale is greater than equal to say a positive number like six, like a sphere, um, mm -hmm. like a, then uh, there's also nice controls on min A that's mm -hmm. known. And uh, with negative scalar, it, it may have to have a different assumption than the min A. I see. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't, the, with the, 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 the stability inequality doesn't quite, yeah, function. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. And, and min A is very, very two-dimensional. If we were to do higher dimensions, we don't think just a minimal of a hypersurface would be enough at all. Um, there's a possibility that Shane was thinking that maybe there should be some sort of descent of minimal surfaces inside minimal surfaces inside minimal surfaces, maybe, but we didn't want to dare make any state conjecture where all of those minimums would have lower bounds. So that sort of is related to um, the positive mass theorem of Shane Yao. This min A stuff is actually related to um, these, these questions of black holes forming and stuff like that. A minimal surface is the horizon of a black hole in three dimensions. So that's of importance. Yes, another chat question. Yes, um, let me draw a picture. Why does min A have to come up in these? So let me just, sorry. 
So that was just basically, we're just up to questions point at this point in the talk. So I think I'll just open a different thing so you can see a picture. So I can answer that question. So what I did actually was I put um, the slides on my webpage. So this today's slides, uh, I can bring up a picture from tomorrow's, just a little bit here. So this would be an example of a sequence with, um, this isn't the bad one, but, um, see how could i explain this so the maybe it's best not to bring up these pictures um i am going to bring up something from a web page so in our original paper here can i click on it let's go to the archive preprint we actually made some examples if you go to the arc the appendix of this paper, we did a bunch of examples in detail. And there's a weird, I think we made a picture of it. You can take a sphere. So picture a universe that consists of one sphere and another sphere. Sorry, this is a very long paper. <laughs> I think I had a picture of it. Oh darn. Okay. I'll just I'll describe it to you in words. Take a sphere, a three-dimensional sphere, and take a second three-dimensional sphere. Think of these as two different universes. And now take a collection of points on both spheres and cut balls out of those points and connect them together. Making basically like stargates from one universe to another so you now have little gates that run from one sphere to the other and you instantly get from one sphere to the other at all these points and the points correspond to each other and these points are getting increasingly increasingly dense you're having more and more of these stargates between the two universes and then in the limit with one kind of notion of orientation on the two universes, you end up where they both just disappear completely. And with another orientation on these two universes, you end up where the limit in the intrinsic flat sense is a sphere with weight too. And both of this kind of limit, you had positive scale curvature for the whole sequence. And the limit space is either disappearing, even though all the spheres have the same size, the gromov hausdorff limit is just a sphere. and the problem was that all these little stargate tunnels, you could you want to eliminate their existence, that you shouldn't have these stargate tunnels or wormholes running between two universes. But every wormhole introduces a stable minimal surface. So that's sort of capturing it. So each one produces a horizon to a black hole. So that's sort of it. I look, I can just I'll make some pictures before tomorrow. I'll draw some pictures that are better than the ellipsoids. The reason the ellipsoids aren't the best counterexamples is that the ellipsoids have volume going to zero. So some people might say, why don't you just assume volume is bounded away from zero? And the example I just described is one reason. Any other questions? I'm going to go back to my, I think I still have it here. Yes, I can make this shared up. You. There. Okay. So in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the scalar compactness con conjecture, the almost rigidity of the positive mass theorem, this geometric stability of scalar torus rigidity, scalar sphere rigidity, prism rigidities, and special cases involving these. Um, volume above distance below conjecture. So each of these conjectures is about showing that a sequence has an intrinsic flat limit and the intrinsic, the intrinsic flat limit is actually a volume preserving intrinsic flat limit to a very specific space. So if it says that the scale torus rigidity theorem, you say it's a geometric stability, you're saying that the limit is actually a torus. 
And for the scale of sphere rigidity, you're saying that the limit is actually a sphere. So you can test these out where you assume that there is a VADB limit and you check, is the VADB limit actually a torus? Is it actually a sphere? So that's the kind of special cases that could be assigned to students or postdocs that are interested in doing these kinds of problems. So if you do one of the problems that involves the VADB limits, you don't actually have to know all this um, ambrosio kirheim theory. What you have to know are the properties of manifolds with scale curvature bounds. And then you just use this very simple definition of VADB convergence is, is a very simple thing to check. You just have to check volumes of converging and distances are bounded below. You have to choose the right maps in order to pull it off, but that's all you have to show. So this has actually been already applied to prove special cases of um, the um, torus rigidity. Okay, so Raquel Perales and uh, Ketterer and uh, Cabrera Pacheco worked on that. I believe that's who it was. I might be messing this up. All right, so anyway, so that's today's. I thought that was enough for one day. And I'm sorry, I'm finishing a little bit early.